Um, and um, uh, so I'm going to introduce Steve Thornton, who is going to be talking to us uh, tonight about Jewish labor organizing in Hartford, and especially the role of women, um, some specific women in that history. Um, Steve is a retired union, union organizer who has lived in Hartford most of his life. He writes for several different print and web uh, publications, and he maintains the Shoe Leather History Project, which is a wonderful website that contains a lot of un known stories about Hartford's history. So if you get a chance to check it out, I'll put that in the chat also for you. Um, he's the author of several books, including the volume Wicked Hartford. And I'm gonna turn it over to Steve and I'm also gonna be sharing my screen um, with his PowerPoint. Um, Steve, did I successfully unmute you? No, unmute. Mute. Okay. How's that? That's good, yep. Okay. So, uh, Elizabeth, I was also going to mention that if people uh, in the chat room, if they want to mention what their grandparents did for work, if they know, I, I'm, I always like to start out talks with that because that's fascinating to see uh, what, um, you know, where people's roots are in terms of their working roots. And, and it always works with older adults and almost never works with <laughs> teenagers. <laughs> so I'd love to know that. Hey. <clears throat> okay, Steve, I'm sharing my screen, so you should be good to go. Okay, I can see you on the little screen. Right. Okay, very good. Yeah. Thanks, well, thank you everybody um for tuning in tonight say what i don't have a picture oh somebody doesn't have a picture does that mean you're not seeing yourself or you're not seeing the screen that i'm sharing i can see it i can see the screen but i don't see my picture as long as you can hear and you can see the screen it should be fine Hi, Carrie. But, you know that you're muted. That's okay. Okay, shall I start, Elizabeth? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thanks. I appreciate everybody tuning in tonight. Please, uh, when we're finished, uh, give me some feedback so you can tell me what works and what doesn't uh, on the talk like this. I'm used to talking to people live and in person, but not so much uh, through this electronic media. Uh, I'll talk for about 30 minutes, and then if there's conversation or questions or stuff you want to tell me about it, I'd love to hear it. So, uh, this is about Jewish labor organizing in Hartford, and specifically Jewish women who were organizers in labor unions in Hartford and Connecticut. I've learned a great deal about Hartford, and especially the lives of working people and their unions. Today, I want to share with you some of the fascinating members of the Jewish community that I've researched and written about. <laughs> That's our dinger. You got that? Yeah. Ah, there we go. But of course, Hartford's good old days weren't so good for many of the city's workers. Poverty was severe in the early 20th century in Hartford. Housing was substandard. There were few regulations guaranteeing safe food or drinking water. Incomes were pitiful for all except those who rode through the Gilded Age in Hartford through on, the, on their upper class berths. Um, and that's, those are the people that I want to talk about, the people who are unknown heroes and heroines. There we go. Um, the problem with um, learning anything about early unions and, and working people's struggles is that there are, um, there's very little history written, none 
in books and uh, very few actual images. This is an image of the, the cityscape, was the image of, of Hartford with G Fox on the left and the Travelers Insurance Company in the far background. We're, we're making it to that. This is an old uh, slum area in Hartford. I think it's Gold Street in Hartford. And you can see the Travelers Insurance Company in that little red tower at the top and G Fox at the left. Uh, the, besides uh, low wages and dangerous conditions, maybe worst of all, the whole family had to work in order to bring home one paycheck. Children and young teens were forced to work in the same da dangerous, unhealthy, and stressful conditions. This is pre precisely why unions were started, first for skilled workers and then for everyone who labored. One of the most tragic and criminal, really, incidents that brought worker safety into focus was the New York City Triangle Shirtwaist Fire on March 25, 1911. 146 workers were killed in a fire that could have been prevented. On the eighth floor on a Saturday with the doors locked and blocked where the fire began. Women and girls and some men, employees perished, some by jumping from the windows. This tragedy spurred the growth of the International Lady Garment Workers Union. And I raise this event because it had an impact on Hartford as well as the Jewish and Italian neighborhoods of New York. In fact, the infamous Triangle Shirtwaist fire had several Hartford connections, including local families who waited for days to see if their loved ones were among the dead. One of the many acts of bravery that saved lives on March 25th, 1911, occurred thanks to George LeWitt, who was a Hartford High School graduate whose family lived on Windsor Street. That's George on the right as a student. On the day of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, George was studying law at New York University. He was in a school building directly across from the Triangle Shop when he heard workers' screams and saw bodies falling. George, his professor, and other students raced to the roof of their building and extended ladders to the desperate garment workers. At least 40 young women were saved by the students' actions. Early in our history, immigrant working com communities got together to provide the most basic services that the employer would not provide and which individual workers could not afford. Evidence of this are the Arbiter Ring cemeteries that still exist in Hartford today. The Workers' Circle of New York was founded first in 1900 by Jewish cloak makers as a mutual aid society providing social services, including medical clinics, old age homes, and burial assistance to immigrants. As the organization defines itself, they recognize the importance of facing challenges within a united front and feeling the, res the resonance of traditional and deeply held Jewish values, emphasizing community and social justice. This is a branch, this is a photo of the Branch 936 Cemetery, and right next to it is the Branch 184. They're right next to each other on Mall Avenue in Hartford. Working people through our unions have always sought for much more than a nickel raise. In fact, in a few words, the first president of the American Federation of Labor, Samuel Gompers, laid out a manifesto, education, peace, justice for all of society. Gompers was a Jewish immigrant born in London and educated there from a family that originally hailed from Amsterdam. Like his father before him, he was a cigar maker who began his apprenticeship when he was 10 years old. He visited Hartford on a number of occasions on labor matters. And here's what he said. What does labor want? 
we want more schools and less jails, more books and less guns, more learning and less vice, more justice and less revenge, more opportunities to cultivate our better natures. To move a little deeper into Hartford now, let's start with May Day, which has been since 1886 a truly American workers' holiday. One of the most persistent and creative groups who took May Day as their own were the Jewish bakers from Hartford's East Side. May 1st was their deadline for shorter hours. They worked up to 20 hours a day, and they slept and lived in the bakeries, and they worked six to seven days a week. They wanted a wide range of changes, including a demand to clean up the filthy conditions that were found in bakeries and to provide part-time work for their unemployed members. During a 1910 strike, they purchased supplies in New Britain. Then they brought them back to Hartford, baked bread on their own, and sold it from push carts on Front Street and Windsor Street. It was a popular item and they won their demands for shorter days and cleaner and safer workplaces. Hartford's Rebecca Weiner was a young organizer sent from the International Lady Garment Workers Union in 1911. She was fired from the Sage Allen department store on March 20th for trying to organize a union. Her comrades in the tailoring department walked out in solidarity. The work was moved to other outside shops, but 300 Hartford tailors at 10 clothing stores refused to handle the struck work from Sage Allen. They were fired too. Weiner and other alteration tailors exposed the unsanitary conditions of their store. Hartford shops, the union reported, had no fire escapes even though they operated many floors above street level. Remember, this was a within a week of the Triangle Fire in New York City that I mentioned before. Rebecca Weiner did not just target the economic and safety conditions of the tailors. Her organizing exposed socially prescribed options that young women faced. She knew that Hartford garment workers worked 57 hours a week, long hours which produced wages that were half of what similar work was paid in New York. A six day a week schedule meant there was almost no time for personal life outside the workplace. Women workers were often prey to male supervisors who had the power to levy fines or withhold wages if the women resisted their sexual advances. In fact, a federal Department of Labor study had already found that nearly half the prostitutes surveyed had previously worked in factories and shops before turning to the streets. And here's what Rebecca Weiner wrote. No working girl can ply her honest calling for less than six dollars hours, excuse me, for less than six dollars a week and be safe from the temptation and defilement to which she is exposed in the polluting atmosphere that surrounds her struggle for decent living. Now these workers, these tailors did not win their fight. They did not have the same power that Sage Allen owner Norman Allen had. He was the head of the State Businessmen's Association and he was a Hartford police commissioner. He was wired, you might say. But this was only the first fight of the ILGWU before they eventually found a number of successes in Hartford. The famous or infamous anarchist Emma Goldman pursued the same goals as Rebecca Weiner. She spoke in Hartford on February 12, 1913. She was called the most dangerous woman in America. Usually it was cops who called her that. Emma talked about love and marriage in Hartford a subject that was as revolutionary as the anarchist theory that she's known for today. 
It was as a Connecticut garment worker in 1888 that Emma Goldman studied anarchist thought. She was working in a New Haven corset factory at the time. In 1890, she briefly started a dressmaking cooperative in that city, and she established herself as an organizer among the immigrant communities. She argued that society did not give women a real choice in how to direct their lives, and that marriage was a one-sided contract, and that factory work had its own special dangers, and prostitution was bound to increase under these conditions. Remember, I, I told you that not all photographs are, are, are um, actual events in Hartford. Many of them are representational, but this is one of several photographs taken by Lewis Hine for the National Child Labor Committee. He took pictures of child labor around the nation. And these are news boys and news girls of Hartford. They were in around 19, I think, 09, they were in a fight between two New York newspaper moguls, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. The two were in a price war, and they lowered the cost of their papers to increase sales. At the same time, they instituted a new policy where the newsies could no longer turn their unsold papers back for reimbursement. The local news agent in Hartford for the New York papers was Herman Koppelman. It was his job to enforce the new rules. Newsies worked from five o'clock in the morning, then to school, then after school sold papers again till 10 o'clock at night. They often worked seven days a week in all kinds of weather, every kind of weather and they were often cheated by customers and harassed by police. These young women, workers were not about to accept the new rule, which meant for them a pay cut without a fight. On the morning of May 1st, 1909, boys and girls from all over the city met at Zion Hall on Winthrop and Pleasant Streets where Barnard Brown School was, and that's now Capital Prep Magnet School to help folks who know the city, give them some context. It was raining that day on May 1st, but that didn't stop 100 kids from marching behind a drum and bugle corps with a huge banner urging customers to buy only local newspapers. The next day, the young workers formally created the Hartford Newsboys Association. They were assisted by Saul Sontheimer of the Central Labor Union, and the mass meeting elected two young newsboys, Harry Brightman as president and Morris Zalkowitz as vice president. The young strikers won great public support, especially from the Hartford newspapers that didn't like the New York competition. But Koppelman employed many strategies to break the strike, including bribery, the creation of a rival union run by his brother, and starting rumors that the strike was over and causing confusion. All this fomented internal strife, and the strike was eventually broken after about the, after the news kids um, voted about four times, and eventually there were enough votes to end the strike. Uh, as a, um, unhappy coda, uh, a few months later, the Newsies learned that Harry Brightman, their president, had become a local agent for the Hearst paper distribution in Hartford. My personal favorite of all Connecticut labor heroes and heroines is this woman, Matilda Rabinowitz, a Ukrainian emigrant. Her family eventually moved to Bridgeport, she worked in local factories and then for the State Department of Labor in Hartford, surveying female workers. She led a number of fierce strikes, including the 1913 Blumenthal Silk Manufacturing Company strike in Shelton, Connecticut, in the Naugatuck Valley, where a private police force hatched a plot to kidnap her to end the strike. 
And in Little Falls, New York, textile mills strike that were successful there, as well as in Southern textile mills and Detroit auto factories. And this was long before uh, the United Auto Workers. She was described as a fierce leader who had, would win the respect of male workers, but the newspapers never failed to comment on her height. So on the right, you see what people meant when they described her also as petite. She's standing between two workers uh, there. And here's a um, typical textile factory floor that Matilda organized. And that's the, there we go. Those are weaving machines behind them. There's so much more to say about her, but I just refer to this book and its author, Robin Legere Henderson, who was Matilda's granddaughter. I had the pleasure of taking Robin around Bridgeport to places where Matilda had lived and worked, the factories that are now shut down and some of them are still standing, some of them have been repurposed. And Bridgeport, as I mentioned, is where her family landed after arriving from the Ukraine. Robin's use of Matilda's writing and her own illustrations, uh, Robin is an artist, make for really fascinating reading of this little known organizer. Since 1919, Jewish and Italian garment workers in Hartford had attempted to organize one particular shop, the Kolodny Garment Shop on Union Place, just across from the train station. It was known as the Elite Shirtwaist Company. Neither the police nor the courts were sympathetic to the strikers. Here, in this newspaper article, we read about a policeman whom allegedly the women strikers jostled, uh, punched him, and knocked his hat off. They were all arrested, and despite support from Josephine Bennett, a prominent Hartford suffragist, and other labor unions, um, the strike was lost, and some of the strikers were forced to return to work. Others were barred. But there were plenty of other dirty, dangerous, low-paying jobs for immigrant workers in Hartford, especially immigrant women. They organized because they had nothing left to lose. March 1941. It must have been, oh, this is a, yes, this is a, a picture uh, representational of the um, elite shirtwaist workers. March 1941, it must have been an extraordinary sight. Women in prison uniforms, homemade, marched back and forth in front of the Kolodny and Myers Company, which grew and moved from Union Place to Capitol Avenue. Heading up this parade was a uniformed prison guard wearing sunglasses and carrying a police baton. The quote unquote prisoners carried signs reading, don't be chained to your machine for less than you deserve. Join the ILGWU. Feigl Levine, 21, portrayed the guard and had staged this colorful protest to draw attention to the union's organizing drive. The young organizer was later arrested for driving a sound truck up and down Capitol Avenue in front of Kolodny's business. 500 workers were employed at his Hartford and New Britain plants. On this, on the first day of the strike, 200 strikers, looking like an army without guns, dressed in smart strike uniforms, all these things were homemade, and overseas caps that read ILGWU and Kolodny striker sashes over their shoulders. The strikers brought their children to the picket line, focusing on how low wages affected their families and their families' health although these kids look really healthy. Um, and here's a children's rally in front of the Kolodny employment office. Uh, it was a good deterrent to anyone who hoped to apply for a job uh, as a scab during the strike. They couldn't get in and they couldn't get through those kids. On April 29th, strikers distributed 25,000 leaflets in downtown Hartford. 
They were all dressed in homemade peasant costumes and were unmistakably union women. Two of the leafleters were brought in for questioning by police as an attempt to intimidate them. Kolodny had four strikers arrested for assault and battery. Two of them, Mort Goodman and Anna Mascar Mascariella, were found guilty based solely on the accusations made by scabs. In July, Kolodny sued to limit the number of pickets in front of his plant. It was getting to him. His motion was denied in Superior Court. Kolodny's label was the Betty Hartford brand. Here are some examples. Uh, they produced mostly inexpensive summer dresses. And the Betty Hartford label was sewn into each garment. And here are some union labels. These are not from the 40s. These are mostly from the 80s and 90s. On the left is the Garment Workers Union label that was around for decades. And on the right, when the Garment Workers joined with the Textile Workers Union, they became Unite. Ralph Kolodny resisted the workers' demands for a union. So the ILGWU, which was very powerful in New York at the time, enticed a New York garment factory to move to Hartford. And the strikers got jobs there. The new shop was direct competition for Kolodny. And the workers sold clothes with the, the union label, with union wages, and benefits. Long story short, Kolodny later went to prison for three years for cheating his workers and for tax evasion. Working women had significant public support from their male counterparts, including that of Rabbi Abraham Feldman of Temple Beth Israel. He was, in fact, a vocal advocate of many progressive pro-people causes. At Yom Kippur in 1927, Rabbi Feldman spoke about atonement in spiritual and social justice terms. He pointed to Henry Ford's distribution of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which he called, quote, an unforgivable crime committed with his connivance against our people, unquote. Ford had apologized for uh, producing the book, but the poison continued throughout Europe's thanks to mass printings that he had made. Rabbi Feldman call, called out the factory owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company, noting that a prison sentence and payment of damages to the owners was deemed sufficient to expiate their crimes. He said, quote, a sin once committed is not eradicable. God desires neither sacrifices nor burnt offerings, but rather a broken and contrite heart a prevention of recurrence of the sin. We cannot undo the past, he said, but we can assure a better future. And uh, there'll be some folks watching this who know both these labor leaders. The influence of Jewish labor activists in Hartford has a pretty long and heroic history. I wanna give a nod to two men. First on the left is Leon Davis, a Polish emigre who moved to Hartford around 1920 and then moved to New York, where he built the Hospital and Healthcare Workers Union Local 1199. Uh, that's my union before I retired. Davis died in 1992 after having led the poorest and least respected workers for decent wages and respect. And on the right is David Pickus, who's worked for 1199 for 40 plus years and retired as its president a year ago. And finally, an activist for social and economic justice since high school, Marilee Milstein became a member of the Hotel Employees Union in 1968 while working as a banquet waitress from 1972 to 1994. She served as a vice president of District 1199 here in New England. She was an organizer and political director, and she led the state employee sector of our union. In 1982, she served as the chair of the state's permanent commission on the status of women. 
For more than 35 years, Mary Lee helped organize thousands of workers, led strikes, and as she was proud to boast, arrested more than 90 times. She made a major, played a major role in building labor and community coalitions in Connecticut and throughout New England. Her comrade, Joe Alvarez of the AFL-CIO said, Mary Lee loved action and provided leadership to countless labor battles. In every campaign, she was looking not just for a win, but what you build along the way. This is just a part of the proud and largely unknown history that I've been able to learn about and help uh, disseminate, and I'm glad you let me share some of it with you. That's my presentation. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I, I, I wasn't able to see the chat while I was sharing my screen, so I'm just going to check it out now. Um, uh, we had a couple different people sharing, uh, as Steve asked, what um, kind of work their uh, grandparents did. Um, uh, I, can, I can read some of those, but if people have any other questions or comments, would you um, either raise your hand um, if you know how to do that on Zoom or um, type something in the chat and, we, and I'll, uh, I'll pass those along, okay? Hi, Carrie. Hi, Taya. Hi, everybody I missed. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, grandparents owned a carpeting store on Maple Avenue in Hartford. Another grandfather's a book binder who printed uh, transfers for uh, Third Avenue Railway in New York City. Um, grandfather did piecework at Underwood Typewriter. Uh, another grandfather was a charter member of the ILGWU, and my grandmother spoke up for the First Ladies Hat Makers Union in Philadelphia at age 15. Wow. That's your, uh, these are all great. Around 1914. Um, somebody else says, uh, grandfather worked at a speakeasy owned by his brother-in-law and then was a jailer in New Haven. <laughs> uh, another grandmother worked in a tie factory. My maternal grandfather was a union coat maker in New Haven. And uh, then he had his own shop. Uh, grandmother was a laundress at the New Haven Hospital. Uh, a glazier on my mother's side, a salesman on my father's. Um, Irish grandfather worked on the railroads in New Haven and was fired for union organizing. My Russian grandmother was a housekeeper and took care of children in homes of the wealthy. Grandfather worked at Armstrong Rubber in West Haven, where my father also worked and was VP of his union. Um, Thea said uh, she had a teacher who told us his grandmother didn't go back to work but took a walk with his grandfather and because of playing hooky did not perish in the Triangle Fire. Wow. Amazing. Wow, wow. Um, let's see. Uh, grandfather worked at Underwood when he first came to America, then became an insurance agent and leader of the Jewish section of the International Workers' Order, which was destroyed during the Red Scare in the 50s. Um, I've written a story about them on my website, um, Shoe Leather History Project, too, of the, okay. the IWO's connection. Um, Carol said her grandfather was a cantor at Agudas Achim, and grandmother is a secretary who lost her job and she asked for the Jewish holidays off. Um, Joel says his Jewish grandfather worked in the mills in Lowell, Massachusetts, making uniforms for the Navy before he went to the Army. Great. Hi, Joel. What about the pioneer women? I'm sorry, can you say that again? The you were going to discuss the pioneer women. Steve, do you want to respond? Well, well my topic was uh, Jewish women who are labor organizers. Um, I haven't I don't, there's an awful lot to, that needs to still be known of ordinary people, but I stick pretty much to Hartford um, because it's, uh, I well, never get anything done. You had a couple of names that you had on your, uh, on your introduction that you were going to discuss the pioneer women and their, uh, 
and they were working hard for it in the, in the uh, women's uh, clothing organizing. Yes. Um, uh, the one story that I, I know particularly well was of Rebecca Weiner, who was an organizer um, at Sage Allen. And um, sh the strike was uh, a pretty tumultuous, and it got a great write-up in the ILGWU's uh, newspaper, which is where I learned most of the facts of it. But like many, many, many other struggles, they weren't recorded, and, they're, and you rarely hear either the names of the union or the names of the workers. You always get the name of the boss and the name of the supervisor. Um, but that's as far as I've been able to get. Are there any other questions or comments or things that people uh, wanted to add into the picture that Steve has done such a nice job of painting for us? Yeah, for, for, those of you, for those of you who were in the Hartford area, you may not know the Greater New Haven Labor History Association, in which Steve is also active in, uh, has an extensive collection, particularly of the ILG, the amalgamated, uh, and the Winchester workers. All of the information now is on in the archives at the Dodd Center uh, at UConn and should be available online. Yeah, it's great stuff that they've done over the years. Thanks for that, Bill. Appreciate it. People have any other questions or comments or things that they'd like to add in? Pine oh, Pioneer Women, that was, that's some information that I obviously should know about and I don't. Do I think, uh, yeah, I think there may have been a little confusion about Pioneer Women associated with the uh, Zionist movement as mm -hmm. opposed to women who were pioneers in we're the pioneers. Here <laughs> yes. In the States. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Was it Ariel who just wrote about that? That's, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Um, just wanted to say that um, I was really glad to learn more about Matilda Rabinowitz, who was one of the women that, who was featured oh. in the um, Trailblazers exhibition that the Jewish Historical Society organized last year. Um, and to see her get a little bit more attention. And it's great to know about that book that her, um, uh, it's her granddaughter. Yes. Yeah. Robin Legere Henderson. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I should mention that um, the Connecticut Historical Society has been working this year on several um, shows on suffrage in Connecticut. And one of the people they feature is Mary Townsend Seymour, the African-American activist from Hartford, who was, um, she worked uh, tangentially on suffrage, but she was also a labor organizer and she was the head of the anti-lynching committee in Connecticut, which was sponsored by the NAACP. She started the first NAACP chapter in Hartford at her home. Um, and there's only one really terrible photograph of her. Um, so we asked people to, uh, we asked an artist to make a, um, a painting of her. And so that painting will be up uh, whenever we get to see the suffrage exhibit. Um, it's, it's really, it's something that she deserves. It's really much better than the, the very dark, um, grainy photograph that seems to be the only one that exists. So hope you get to see that sometime. Or you can see it on my website. That's right. <laughs> Uh, so right. we, we, we did have a question about how long did the Kolodny uh, firm continue in business? Um, it says Levine and Levine and Colchester, was it organized? Uh, I don't know. Um, I know that Kolodny kept um, growing. And I know that uh, a, a, a brother I know from, who lives in North Carolina now, worked um, with the Betty Hartford label. So that means it had to have been, it must have been going in the 60s, maybe not in Hartford, well, probably not in Hartford, but elsewhere. Uh, it probably spun off uh, into other organizations. Um, he went into real estate 
And in fact, he uh, rented to the state of Connecticut um, one of the offices in one of his buildings in Hartford. And that was the uh, department that actually investigated his tax fraud and put him in jail. So he, they were paying rent to him, but they were also um, making sure that he didn't get away with the murder. And folks know that long stretch of factory buildings up and down Capitol Avenue uh, between, what am I thinking? Um, well, people know where, where it is, the little coffee shop and a couple other places. And they're all now state um, departments. Uh, and I think that Park Place to Flower Street, beautiful. That's right. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> um, and uh, all those buildings now are um, refurbished factories. And one or two of the buildings was Kaladni's. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, we had a comment about researching connections in Greater Hartford between the kosher meat boycotts of the early 1900s, which were yes. consumer boycotts um, and were led by women and um, Jewish and other women union organizing. Um, what I've seen, I've seen written about that is that I'm familiar with the meat uh, protests in New York and the those were the mothers, if you will, of the younger women who were working in short waist factories like Triangle and so on, um, uh, generationally. But, um, but I don't know that we know very much about that in Hartford. Yeah, I don't have any idea. If, uh, whoever mentioned that, uh, if you can throw me a couple of uh, threads, I'll do some research on that. That sounds um, fascinating. Thank you. I've learned there's actually a... Um, I'm not sure it was a movie or a TV series that's being made about the kosher meat boycotts that's just called Boycott. So um, keep your eyes out for that. It looks interesting. Great. Um, any other comments or questions for Steve? Any other questions I can't answer? <laughs> Steve, uh, I think that one of the problems, and I don't, I don't see a problem, but the labor movement in the Hartford, the Hartford area was extraordinarily strong throughout the 20s, 30s, and the 40s that even led to a general strike here in Hartford at, during, after the Second World War. Right. And the biggest disappointment or tragedy that involved the entire labor movement was the Red Scare. Yeah. That just basically destroyed all the progressive unions, all the progressive labor organizers, and not only destroyed it, but also people from Hartford dispersed all over the country to other parts away from Hartford because there was nothing here for them anymore. The government and the uh, leaders of industry and whatever were very successful. And we shouldn't forget that, that how strong a labor movement was. And it was a labor movement that was made up of uh, Jews, Blacks, uh, non-Jews, Hispanics. And it's very important to know that. Yeah, thank you, Henry. That's uh, That's, really important. I've done a little bit of writing on that and some of my um, other work. Uh, I've written about the, what's gone on at Colt from, well, there are a number of uh, organizing efforts in the 20s and 30s that didn't succeed. Um, and it wasn't until the United Electrical Workers organized them um, in the uh, early 40s, the Colt, in, that, that actually the, the workforce became a, a a very, I, uh, in my estimation, a pretty militant organization. And then, of course, there was the uh, sort of the purge of all uh, unions that would not sign the anti-communist pledge uh, back then, even though their work, they had gotten special distinction from the government during World War II for their high production. Uh, and then a year later, uh, the wonderful production through the war, and then a year later, they were being 
um, dismissed as as uh, reds. There's a whole lot there that has to be um, uncovered still. And I wish we had people like uh, Laddie Mikulowski around still, who know a lot of it. You knew a lot of it. You know, unfortunately. Um, that's that's another sort of unknown territory. Uh, a similar thing happened in Waterbury, you know, where all the brass workers unions all the way through to the mining industry got destroyed during the same Red Scare period. And then the class co collaborationists uh, became union leaders and became head of the Connecticut labor movement for a long time. <laughs> Some of them are still even honored to this day because people don't know what the damn history is. Sure. sure. And I, I can say John Driscoll's name, Hank, if, uh, Bubba, if you don't want to. <laughs> no, no, uh, I, was, I, can, I, was just, I was just wondering how well people's memory was. Yeah. I mean, Driscoll was a major problem and, and, yeah. he, and he put a, a lot of class co collaborationist uh, people in positions within the labor movement. And it's really taken a long time to uh, get our feet back on the ground from those characters. I mean, those fights were going on, you know, in, in this, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s and 90s in, uh, you know, in the house of labor. I mean, we still had all those characters we had to fight with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a congressional committee uh, chaired by uh, Robert LaFollette, and he, I think this was in the th 30s. Um, and he uh, investigated the infiltration of labor unions by uh, spies that were, and, and, and company spies that were hired by companies, cor corporations. And they were not just gathering information, they were disrupting um, uh, union activities. So when people wanted to um, organize themselves for better working conditions, here there were paid uh, people who whose only job it was to um, disrupt them. And I, I haven't gotten my hands on that report yet, but there were some newspaper articles that, that gave some brief information about the things that um, the La Follette Committee found um, during their investigation. Thank you. Um, I'm just putting uh, Steve's uh, shoe leather history website in the chat for anybody who's not familiar with it. Is that the correct URL, Steve? Shoe leather. Shoe leather. Historyproject.com. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great resource. Um, uh, so thank you all so much for coming and thanks so much to Steve for sharing his research with us and for the work he's doing to uncover some of this history. Um, and uh, uh, we appreciate everyone uh, joining with us tonight and uh, hope, hope you learned something new and interesting and thank you for sharing your stories. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Everybody. you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Hey, brother. Thank you. <laughs> oh, there's a whole lot of people here I didn't get to say hi to. Thanks very much, guys. I appreciate okay. it. Thank I you. have one question. I see everybody's jumping off. Go for it. <laughs> okay. um, and I have to jump off, too, because I have a work Zoom at ATM. But, um, Steve, it's great to see you. I apologize I missed the first part of your presentation, but um, have you, and I, and I never met Marilee, but I heard a lot about her. Mm. Um, but um, I know a lot of her contemporaries. Um, as, have you looked at any, or is there any kind of interest in doing oral histories with people of her uh, generation, like Julie Kushner or Maida? I mean, Julie's not from Connecticut, but she did a lot of work in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm, I'm sure there's others um, in her circle. Oh, there is she is Joel Brooks. I don't know. Yeah, hi Joel. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I used to work with Steve. <laughs> hi Joel, and I, thank you. And I grew up in West Hartford. <laughs> we, um, I think there's a, you know, what I did, as you can see, from I talked like from 1900 to 1940, right? And I've done a lot of research in the 1800s, and I haven't considered my era 
<laughs> as history. So I sort of, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I don't want to, I guess I don't want to admit it. Um, but uh, I think there's a real need for uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s uh, and on information. And we should be, I mean, there are a lot of people who are listening to this, who are part of this now, who are uh, uh, very good friends and comrades of Merrily and, and, and other people, and they themselves have stories. Um, so uh, I really encourage people to get it down on tape or videotape or type it up. Uh, I'll always be a receptacle, even if I can't do the, all the research myself. So thank you. And thank you, Elizabeth. Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. I have to jump off. Take care. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks so much for joining right. us. Thank, thank you. Great. Thank you both. Thank you. Hi, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Bye-bye. <laughs>